The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. Then it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. I... Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. All right, good day, tokers and toquettes, and welcome. It is Thursday, February 7th, 2013, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome to the show. So glad you could be here. We got all sorts of great stuff to bring you today, including our guest, Nate Bradley from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He'll be here today in our Cops Say Legalized Drugs segment at half past the hour. He's got a new book out called The Medical Marijuana Survival Guide, all about how to be a patient, a caregiver, a grower, or a dispensary operator, and how how to survive encounters with law enforcement. He's a former cop himself, so he's got all the tips and tricks you need to know. Make sure you tune in at half past for that interview with Nate Bradley. He's also formed a new group called Lawmen Protecting Patients, and you can see this at lawmenpro.org. We'll ask him more about that new organization in our interview segment. In our radical rant at the end of the show, we're going to take a look at a case of the DEA trying to use a $37 pot buy as the justification for seizing a $1.5 million building. Boy, there's the business you want to get into, huh? A lot of profit potential there. Just become an agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. We'll talk about that at the Radical Rant. Also on today's show, we'll have our daily toker tunes. It's Groovin' Thursday today, and I got another great tune from MJD and Shooter. This one's called Photographic Eye. And remember, if you've got a song or a band you'd like to have heard here on the Russ Belville Show, if they're unsigned, if their music is pod safe, and we can play it for uh, our podcast, just let us know through our contact form. Just go to 420radio.org and look for contact and just uh, send us an email. Let us know about the band and uh, we'd love to get them uh, exposed here on 420 Radio. Also on today's show, we're going to go behind the headlines and a very interesting case for behind the headlines today where a medical marijuana advocate in Washington state is suing the state for $6 million for 82 plants they destroyed in an illegal raid. We'll tell you a little bit about the back background on his story as well. Plus, uh, take a look at the comments on the story, which kind of shows you how far we have yet to go, even in places like Washington State. But before all that, we start with your 420 Radio News. We got some raids in San Bernardino, Missouri Democrats proposing decrim, Steamboat Street, speed, ha, that's a tough one to say. We'll just get to it when we get to the news. Stick around. Ah. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation.
California is the center of marijuana consciousness. That's why High Times Magazine is returning to the Golden State for our second High Times Medical Cannabis Cup in Los Angeles. That's right. Come to L.A. Center Studios on February 16th and 17th for this high-flying event. Meet the medical cannabis industry, visit our extra-special medicating area, and sample the best cannabis products of Southern California. There'll be cultivation seminars and presentations about getting pot legalized, not just in California, but everywhere. Be there on Saturday evening when we host a Rock'em Sock'em concert with surprise musical guests. And don't forget Sunday night and the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup Awards when we honor the best sativa, best indica, best hybrid, best concentrate, and best edibles of the L.A. medical cannabis scene. Plus, we present the High Times Lifetime Achievement Award to marijuana superstar Tommy Chong. Come to the City of the Angels on February 16th and 17th for a High Times Cannabis Celebration. Go to MedCanCup.com for details. Live the high life. Be proud of who you are. Be part of the growing cannabis community. Now it's time for your 420 Radio News for Thursday, February 7th, 2013. I'm Russ Belleville. DEA and police raid three medical marijuana dispensaries plus a home in San Bernardino from the San Bernardino County Sun. Federal drug agents, local police, city attorneys, investigators, and code enforcement officers fanned out across the city Wednesday, raiding a chain of medical marijuana dispensaries and a private residence, police said. A DEA spokeswoman, Special Agent Sarah E. Pullen, said, quote, The search warrants were all served simultaneously without incident. Once the evidence is prosecuted, the U.S. Attorney's Office will make the final decision if any criminal charges will be filed, end quote. Assistant City Attorney Jolena Greider said these businesses are attracting criminal elements that loiter and panhandle, making people uncomfortable. She said, quote, the crime rate has risen within a one mile radius of these businesses. I think everyone is waiting on the state Supreme Court ruling that would decide how much further we can go in these cases, end quote. The court heard arguments from attorneys representing the city of Riverside and a Riverside-based medical marijuana dispensary, the Inland Empire Patients Health and Wellness Center. The state high court is expected to issue a ruling within 90 days that will be binding on other cases challenging city's use of zoning to ban dispensaries. Missouri Democrats propose lighter marijuana penalties from St. Louis today. Some Democrats in the Missouri House are pushing legislation that would reduce the penalty for possessing small quantities of marijuana. The legislation, modeled after a Columbia City ordinance, would allow for a maximum fine of $250 for possession of less than 35 grams of marijuana or paraphernalia. And it would allow courts to grant a form of probation that, if successfully completed, would result in no permanent criminal record. Under the proposal, someone found with less than 35 grams of marijuana re would receive a summons similar to a traffic ticket instead of being arrested. Steamboat Springs passes temporary emergency ordinance banning marijuana clubs. Steamboat Springs has joined a growing list of mus municipalities in Colorado that have adopted emergency ordinances temporarily banning the establishment of private marijuana clubs, as reported by the Denver Post. Whether the city plans to ban private pot clubs permanently won't be clear until officials and the community have had the chance to discuss it in detail. As he proposed the emergency ordinance Tuesday night, Steamboat Springs Public Safety Director Joel Ray said it would help to eliminate a gray area and a loophole some are finding in Amendment 64. Quote, there are marijuana clubs popping up around the state of Colorado, and we've heard rumors of one or two possibly opening up in Steamboat Springs. We want a stopgap on this issue, end quote. Ray said Wednesday that he and other city officials haven't taken a position on whether private marijuana clubs ever should be allowed in the city. Washington state lawmaker asks DEA to reclassify medical marijuana from the Oregonian. The Senate Health Care Committee for Washington State today heard Jeannie Cole Wells, Senator of Washington, formal request that the DEA reclassify medical marijuana as a Schedule II substance. Schedule I drugs, according to the DEA, do not have medical uses and have a high potential for abuse. The DEA defines Schedule II drugs as having slightly less potential for abuse than Schedule I drugs, but are still considered dangerous. However, they often have legitimate medical uses. 
Senator Cole Wells said it doesn't make sense for marijuana to be classified as more dangerous than heroin-based painkillers like OxyContin, which is physiologically addictive. Medical evidence has proved that marijuana doesn't share the harmful side effects of the drugs in its schedule, she said. Luchez Purifoy becomes latest Florida Gator arrested for marijuana from ESPN. Florida cornerback Luchez Parafoy was arrested early Sunday morning and charged with misdemeanor possession of marijuana, making him the seventh member of the Florida Gators arrested for marijuana over the past 25 months. In addition to Purifoy, cornerback Janoris Jenkins twice, linebacker Chris Martin, defensive lineman Kedrick Johnson, safety Deontay Saunders, defensive tackle Leon Orr, and defensive tackle Jafar Mann have also been arrested for marijuana possession since coach Will Muschamp took over for Urban Meyer in January of 2011. According to the Gainesville Police Department report, Purifoy was a passenger in a car that was stopped for a violation. The officer noted one passenger threw a marijuana cigarette out the window and saw a 2.5 gram bag near the car's emergency brake. That's your 420 Radio News for Thursday, February 7th, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines and take a look at a Washington State medical marijuana advocate suing for $6 million for the loss of 82 marijuana plants in an illegal raid. You're listening to The Russ Belvel Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Welcome back, everybody. Time for us to go behind the headlines. We're taking a look at a story up here in the Pacific Northwest that I've had my eye on for a while. Uh, it's the story of one of our colleagues, Adam Assenberg, uh, Michael Adam Assenberg is his full name. And this is profiled in MyNorthwest.com. Linda Thomas writes this one up. And uh, the story is medical marijuana advocate to sue Washington for $6 million. And the basis of this case was that uh, Adam Assenberg was arrested in May of 2011 for growing and distributing medicinal marijuana. And uh, last month, he's had a number of cases. Last month, the Whitman County prosecutor dismissed charges against him, citing a new interpretation of medical marijuana laws in Washington State. And earlier this week, a superior court judge ordered that all property seized during a raid of his Colfax home be returned to him. So he's gotten all of his equipment back. He's got all the everything that was seized during the raid has been uh, taken uh, is has been ordered returned back to him. But he's suing now for the 82 plants that were destroyed uh, during the raid. Uh, so this is back in January 2011. At Adam Assenberg started a medical marijuana business called Compassion for Patients. A few months later, the police arrested him for selling narcotics. They, went, they assumed that they went to my house, there'd be thousands of dollars in cash and pounds of pot, he says. They found $90 and seven ounces of marijuana. <laughs> so, woo, the big pot kingpin. 
Authorities also found 82 immature plants that were seized and taking out, taken out of their containers, destroying them. So this guy is suing for $6 million for 82 seedlings, basically. <laughs> Starts, right? Not 82 mature plants. But he says, these were strains that I was working on for years that I can't replace. He was growing the plants for distribution to people with medical marijuana. He was a licensed dispensary for the state of Washington. But officials said the state law says a medical marijuana provider could only have one patient at a time. Assenberg said he had one patient and his wife, who was also licensed, who had one patient. And this is that uh, that loophole that a lot of the the uh, folks in Washington have been using for a long time, where they had said, you know, I, I'm just a caregiver for one patient at a time. Just so happens I have a storefront and one patient at a time line up uh, to be my, I, so I can be the caregiver for them. The most recent uh, Washington decision said, yeah, that's uh, that seems to be all right. So that's uh, part of the basis of why he's getting all this stuff back. But uh, he's starting the civil suit. He's uh, It's a civil suit, $6 million against the Quad City Drug Task Force. And uh, he points out that law enforcement does not want marijuana uh, no matter what. Uh, they do not want it to go to the people it needs to go to. They're taught that this is illegal no matter what, and they're going to enforce it no matter what the people say. So he's going to prove a point here, hit them where it hurts, $6 million uh, uh, lawsuit. Now, what brought this to my attention is part, partly this man's story. Uh, he became a medical marijuana patient because he was a security guard in Riverside, and he was guarding this place that had dynamite. Some guys try to break into the place to rob some dynamite. He gets in their way. They thwack him in the back with a baseball bat, knocks him 15 feet off of a railroad bridge into a, ri a, a riverbed full of boulders, breaks his back in like six or seven different, nine, nine different places, was told he'd never walk again. Uh, but through a lot of rehab and a lot of hard work, he gets to the point where he's now walking. But then seven years after this attack, he's still suffering these massive seizures, dozens of seizures a day. And one day he decides he can't he can't take the pain anymore. He takes one of them steak knives and, you know, feels the rib cage. This is in the story, feels his rib cage to where his heart is and then puts the knife into his own heart three times to try to kill himself. The pain is so bad. The seizures are so bad. He made, managed to survive. He died once on the operating table, managed to survive his suicide attempt. And then he discovers medical marijuana in 2004. And it, when he discovers medical marijuana, it takes care of the seizures, takes care of the pain. It's a miracle for this guy. So why I wanted to bring this to your attention is, I mean, it's great this guy's suing for $6 million. His story is a tragic story of becoming a patient, but, you know, lots of people have tragic stories. I wanted to go behind the headlines on this one to dip down into the comment section where even in the Pacific Northwest, even where we have such support, even where marijuana is legal, we have people that are just incredible haters about this. Uh, the commenter who goes by the name shark 75 wrote this at seven 49 in the morning. Come on, Newton, the alcohol versus marijuana argument is tired. Yeah, yeah, it's the miracle drug. According to marijuana for dummies with forward by Cheech and Chong, it cures cancer, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? 99% of the people that smoke it are stoners. This guy was a drug dealer who was in violation of federal law. It's good that he got raided. This guy had 82 plants. This is, he writes at 757, so about eight minutes later. This guy had 82 plants, and you expect me to believe that between him and his wife, there were two patients? Come on, dude. Maybe two patients with bogus prescriptions i'd be willing to bet any anything that there was a line of illegal patients out the door at this guy's place those are the strange i worked on for years that i can't replace he says for two patients what a hero ha ha please he's a drug dealer and uh, he goes on there's there's more of this stuff uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning are you stoned already when you say you met this guy in a hearing what does that mean was it a stoner seminar you attend this guy's legal hearings? Are you some kind of stoner groupie? Do you have a steady job? No further questions, Your Honor. And and this is the kind of attitude that is still out there. This is uh, in, th this still exists even in a story where they explain that the man's background is one where he was beaten in an attack, left for paralyzed, tried to kill himself, is living through dozens of seizures a day. 
And even in the face of that, people can still be cruel and dispassionate about this. It just, it's remarkable that this kind of hatred and this kind of mindless demonization of marijuana and its users still exists. And there's another one. There's another person here, uh, CDBTX, who says 82 plants. How much pot is produced per plant? How many grams per ounce? Blah, 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 blah. And, and you know, trying to make the case that this guy's some kind of out of control drug dealer. When they, they point out in the story that the cops go to his house and find what? Nine ounces and, you know, seven ounces and 90 bucks. <laughs> He's no out of control drug dealer. And if he were, if this guy who could possibly have no other way of making a living were getting marijuana for patients and getting money for that. The patients are better off. He's better off. He's got an income. Sometimes I just can't believe I live in the same country with some of these people. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to find some way of helping it or curing it somehow, but I guess haters just got to hate. It's hard to cure ignorance. We'll try. Knowledge. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you talking to that reefer man. You know, I've been playing rock and roll for a lot of years, and I've done it all. Now I do it without drugs. Hey, don't get me wrong, I still party with the best of them, but now I do it clean. You know, I'm on top of everything I do. That's right, baby. We're keeping the funk alive right here at Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink, your groovy home of soul, funk, and disco. disco. So join me, Big Daddy, every Thursday night at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, at the Funky Roller Rink, where every night is Saturday night. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes. The best in pod save 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip-hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, welcome back, everybody. Time for some Groovin' Thursday tunes. And we got another submission from our friends out there uh, with uh, MJB Shooter uh, HDI Records. Thanks a lot, guys, for uh, sending some more tunes. If you know of a uh, record producer, record record label out there trying to get some more uh, exposure for 420-related artists, this is the place. Send them in here to 420radio.org. Not only do we play them here on the Russ Belville Show, which goes out podcast to thousands, but it's also in replay rotation in our Daily Toker Tunes lineup, especially the Podsafe music. You'll hear a lot of that replayed over and over. Some of these songs that are like unreleased songs that are, you know, by unknown artists are now some of my favorite tunes. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the what the latest Beyonce tune is, but I could tell you about uh, uh, Disciples of Panic Earth. <laughs> you know, I can tell you about uh, Ian Lloyd, for example. So we are, it kind of builds us our own musical library, our own genre. And I, I, I feel that music's a very, very important part of the cannabis culture, you know, dating all the way back to the reefer jazz era, Cab Calloway and these guys that were first coming up with our culture, muggles, jive, tea, and all of that, to now the hip hop generation, which has incorporated a whole bunch of the marijuana movement into their lyrics, into their uh, fashions and into their, uh, into their promotions and videos. Uh, we see it from Rihanna smoking a, a dube on stage to uh, all of the you know red man and and cypress hill and all of these acts so really happy to keep promoting this music keep sending it in this is from hdi records off the album left field volume one it's mjd and shooter with photographic eye Ew. 
você, nós dois Aqui, nesse terraço, à beira-mar I swear to God, you niggas couldn't make this shit up if you tried California Kush, my room is up in the sky And damn, when it came up, I took my girl to dinner, told her I am on You getting cake, cause half the record label we own We had a steak with Michael Levi, we paid Paid for 30 minutes, what your summer job could make Flow hot, so don't put us in the ranks I'd rather burn you niggas CDs and I don't need blanks Yes, I, young sir, super fly monster with the pan Kush Got me in the sky, I, I, never back out Gotta bring them racks out I mean these niggas can't see me, it's a blackout My niggas grinding, so we put nothing over bread Taking niggas to school, my projection is overheads We the future, so just quote this tomorrow We so ahead of you niggas that we wrote this tomorrow Nice Eu, você, nós dois Aqui, nesse terraço Yo, it's crazy how you tried to play me At first I wanted to introduce you to Mr. Haiti But after the smoke cleared, I won't let you face me I embraced this dilemma that will not break me Besides, the shit I spit has been kinda hot lately Though life for me has been quite shady The branch I'm holding on to is kinda shaky I know it's breaking, while my back's aching But thank God it's only cause my wings are growing As I continue flowing, I see the seeds I'm sowing Inspire me to keep going And if the Lord wills, I will reach my moment Everlasting and definitely The moment I finally defeat the devil in me Move on to better things like lay my head on the beach But before I get the chance to rest in peace I'll be in the field of weaponry to set us free Ew. Você, nós dois, aqui nesse terraço, à beira-mar. Eu, você, nós dois, aqui nesse terraço, à beira-mar. O sol já vai caindo e o seu olhar parece acompanhar. The March issue of High Times Magazine is here, just in time for playoff season in the National Football League. But did you know that NFL players who use pot receive the toughest penalties in sport? In our March 2013 issue, High Times investigates the NFL's wrong-headed policies and examines how pot can help athletes off the field. We also tee up an outstanding profile of one of the world's greatest strains with the Hayes Craze. Senior Cultivation Editor Danny Danko weighs in on the origins of this outstanding sativa. And editorial director Dan Sky takes a high-minded look at the outdoor harvest of 2012. Growers are getting higher prices for the product and strains are better than ever. Plus, we'll take you inside of one of the most unique gardens you'll ever see, a state-of-the-art underground bunker that allows growers to create the perfect environment for pot. Also in this issue, Saturday Night Live's Jason Sudeikis drops by to talk about his new film, Movie 43. And guess what? Jason likes pot. Plus, we cover the most important story of the year. Pot is legal in Colorado and Washington. Pick up the March issue of High Times Magazine for the very best marijuana coverage on the planet. Be part of the growing cannabis community. On newsstands now. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Norman. And if you're one of the 26 million Americans who smoked marijuana last year, you need to get involved in the drive to legalize marijuana. We need your help to stop the senseless arrest of more than 800,000 Americans each year on marijuana charges. Together, we can end marijuana prohibition and stop the arrest of marijuana smokers. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at norml.org or call toll-free 888-67-NORMAL.
One of the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message. Cops say legalize drugs. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's uh, 30 after the hour, and joining us here for Cops Say Legalized Drugs, we have Nate Bradley with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition and now Executive Director of LPP, Lawman Protecting Patients. Nate, welcome back to the show. How's it going, man? It's going very good, and uh, you know, right out of the gate, I want to ask you about this new org, Lawman Protecting Patients, which is at lawmenpro.org. What's this all about? Um. I, it's it's basically after prop after I worked on prop nineteen last or not last year now it's been it's been uh it's been, in two thousand and ten I really started to work more on the uh, medical on the the medical mar the medical <laughs> marijuana side mm-hmm. of uh of a uh, advo of a uh, adva uh adva advocacy and um. I saw a need for an organization of retired cops, kind of like myself, who had become patients, who needed more info on it and wanted to advocate at the um, same time. And I worked with LEAP, and it wasn't like I had a problem with LEAP at all. I still, they asked to work with me on this. It was, I wanted something that was focused on the medical use of, of a cannabis and the people who wanted to, you know, uh, uh, add to add advocate for it because sometimes with leap topics would come up like these these are the guys that want to legalize you know heroin Mm -hmm. and they're here to talk about you know medical uh uh, marijuana and so i wanted something a little bit different than that and so that's that's where um um, uh lpp um (laughs) came from all right, so LPP, lawmenpro.org. I've got the uh, logo up there on our screen, Lawmen Protecting Patients. And I think this is a, a good idea because uh, one of the things that we find in California and other medical marijuana states is uh, sometimes patients will hear about medical marijuana and they'll say, oh, goody, and they'll get their recommendation. And w- in some states, they'll go get their card from the state and they'll think, okay, yeah. I'm legal. Can you explain uh, how you're going to help them get through that and, and, and this? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's the biggest thing I actually hear from talking to a, um, um, on both sides. Understanding w- what legal means in your state. In our state of, like, for example, in our state of, uh, of uh, California, where, where I live, we don't ask, people don't actually realize that your doctor's recommendation gives you a, um, a, 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 a medical defense in court only. It doesn't actually stop the cops from taking you to jail or writing you a, 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 um, a ticket if you have, if you have um, under an ounce. Mm. And so people need to understand that right off the bat because you, you, you hear horror stories from people like the cops search my car, the cops search my kids, and it's like, it's, it's unfortunately that until we actually change the laws, and remove those laws from the books, which allow cops to um, um, do that. You're still your um, us as patients. We're always going to have those types of of uh, of, uh, of uh, issues in our state. Absolutely, and and to in that respect, to try to help get more people information on this, I understand you've written now a new book, uh, the Medical Marijuana Survival Guide. Let's tell folks a little bit about that. Right on. Thank you. Um, basically, that was uh, that the medical marijuana survival guide was a, 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 a culmination of everything I've done for um, patients and everything I've learned the uh, past couple of years since I've joined the um, um, <laughs> movement. And um, what it basically is, is I break down... The, the, the three main questions or the, the three to four main issues that I've heard from patients, which is traffic stops, home encounters, what to do if they're walking home, what to do if the cops knock off on their doors. And so I wrote, I wrote a chapter for each one of those things. I explained how to, how to handle a traffic stop. I mean, how to handle a, a, a traffic stop, what to do 
when the cops originally, you know, hit their lights, there are things people can do to avoid being stopped in the um, first place. You know, there's a list of red flags that cops will see when they walk up to your car that will make them think that there's marijuana in the car. Things that you don't even realize that, you know, you that, that as patients or just people who use cannabis do. Hmm. So I cover a, a, a lot of those issues, and then I also cover issues like talking to your mom and dad about becoming a patient, and if you want to be an advocate, how to then speak out as one. That's excellent. The Medical Marijuana Survival Guide, folks, if you want to learn more about it, it's on the web, the420survivalguide.com. And we'll put that in our chat room as well, the420survivalguide.com. Nate Bradley is the author of, the, the author of this and uh, a former police officer turned medical marijuana patient. So if anyone would know, it would be you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, <laughs> well, Nate, we got you. some questions from our chat room coming up, and I just wanted to run one by you. You know, one of, Go for a, it. Another subject that's been you know debated very hotly you know since this last December is uh, Second Amendment and firearm rights. And one of our chatters would like to know, uh, how do you interpret interpret the effect of medical marijuana and, you know, how does that intersect with patients' rights under the Second Amendment? Do you feel like uh, patients lose their Second Amendment rights? Yes. Well, I mean, we lost our Second Amendment rights the second they passed the, con- the, the, the controlled substance of that. You know, mm-hmm. that's when it actually happened. Mm-hmm. You know, um, what the letter that came out last year that a lot of that got a lot of people talking about it, before even 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 before Obama started talking about all, all these new guns, these new gun control measures, was a letter from the director of the um, ATS. And what that letter was, he sent a letter to just the licensed firearm. I mean, the people who hold license who help federal licenses to um, to uh, um, sell firearms. And it was in response to questions from people in medical marijuana state. And that letter basically said, if you know the person who is buying a weapon from you or ammo is a card holder because they tell that they told you, or you know for a fact, you can't sell them because that means they use it. So, but it also very clearly, I mean, it, it also said they didn't have to ask you and you don't have to tell the gun store owner that you are a patient at the same time. So they kind of created a, 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 a don't ask don't tell things mm-hmm. for patients. Yeah. So as long they're not going to be, and they're also don't they don't have they're, a lot of I want to just calm people's fears. They're not getting groups of people ready to start knocking on the doors of patients who who can and to see if they have done. That was never the actual issue. They don't have resources for that. It's 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 basically with just to tell people if you own a license to sell firearms, you can't sell a gun or ammo to people who you know for a fact have a card. Mm-hmm. And and to be clear, you know, we covered in Oregon, yeah. you know, Leland Berger took to the Supreme Court this case of Oregon sheriffs denying concealed firearms permits. Yeah. It's a whole different thing. This is gun store owners just not yeah, being allowed with, to sell. With federal licenses to lose. It's the same it's, it's, it's the same federal versus state issue. So they're just kind of flapping their wings. They didn't even tell them to go after people or take ammo away from people. It was just simply if you have knowledge that they're using marijuana, don't sell them a gun. Mm-hmm. All right. And that, I'm sorry, and, and not to kind of squish down, I mean, not, not to say the fears aren't, because people, I have seen that happen. I have seen people try and twist laws and stuff, so to kind of speak on that issue a little bit more. With, you do have a firearm in your house, and you do have a, a, you are growing marijuana, or you have marijuana in your house, where they'll speak you is if, you, if they show up to do a check at your house, and you're standing in front of your garden holding a shotgun. Versus if you have a shotgun in, in your closet, in your, in, in your bedroom of your house, like any, 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 any other, any, any other person does. So those types of things are, are, are what cops look for. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, you mentioned in coverage of this, uh, medical marijuana survival guide that there's, there's, uh, certain things that uh, cops are looking for uh, in, in the case of a traffic stop. And of course, I want to give, have you give away the whole book or anything, but is there... Oh, I'd t- love to talk about the, 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 the red flag. I love... Here, first of all, I didn't make... I did the book to not make money, just to educate people. So I'll talk about it all, you know, all, all day long, you know, but that's why, you know, 
that's why I'm broke like every other, you know, activist. I hear you. <laughs> it's just like, I don't do this. I just take it to, to stay out of jail. That's all I care about, you know? Um, no, um, red flag. The red flag's right off the top of my head. Um, the big things you're looking for that they're going to, the, there's things you can do to avoid being stopped in the, in the um, first place. We'll, we'll hit those up. A couple things people don't realize are, especially in, 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 in my state, you have to have a license plate light that works. The broken license plate light is the number one thing cops use to stop cars. It's hmm. a $2 car, $2 fix, and most people don't even realize they have a license plate light. So check that when you drive at night, because that's the first thing that they use. And also just to do a normal walk around your car and check your brake lights, your, 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 uh, turn, your, um, turn, your, um, turn <laughs> signals, and make sure you have a front license plate attached. So those are some, some, some things people can do right away to make sure that they don't get stopped. If you do get stopped, there's some things that, that the cops will, you know, they'll walk up to the car. Things will make them think, hmm, there's something going on here. And they're kind of easy, but um, you, you don't want to have pro-marijuana stickers on the back of your car, you know? <laughs> Make your car look like it's driven by your grandmother. Um, don't have High Time magazine sitting in your back seat. Don't have lighters out without, without um, well, I'm sorry, lighters out without um, um, evidence of a, of a, <laughs> cigarette wrapping or um or um or um cigarettes will also get cops oh actually there's there's case law which says they can use that to actually to use that as a reasonable um <laughs> suspicion to um keep looking forward, you know. Hmm. So there's um another big thing is somehow wrapping papers, your your wrapping papers end up in the glove box. It's like a magnet. And when, with the second you pop your glove, grab your registration and your um, insurance. Make sure before you leave that you don't have wrapping papers. I mean, or um, not wrapping papers, rolling papers. You know, your papers sitting there in, in your glove box. <laughs> That's huge because that'll actually give them cause to um, ask you. Yeah. Is there is there weed in the car? What are those for? Cigarettes. Don't light up a cigarette when you first been stopped. Um, that screen, I'm nervous. You know, those are huge things. Hmm. We have a question from our chat room. Uh, they'd like to know when stopped by an officer, should you automatically give your marijuana card with your license? No, don't. And then this is key. Don't lie. If they ask you, do you have marijuana in the car? I smell something or X, Y, Z. Don't lie. You know, don't lie about it, but don't volunteer ever. Never vol never volunteer anything when talking with cops. Don't lie, but don't offer it up. You know, you know either. Mm -hmm. We uh, wanted to get a clarification on this. Were you saying that if the cops see a lighter but no evidence of cigarette smoking, that that is they'll a actually look. Yeah, wow. look. And and that gives them the probable cause for a search, or just gives them the clue that they reasonable, should... not probable cause. Okay. It gives them something called reasonable, <laughs> reasonable, uh, reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion. Okay. Reasonable suspicion, and that's what they you know, I had, And so that's not that doesn't give you the right to go into a car, but that gives you the right to keep looking because there's case law which says you can only stop somebody on the side of the road for a a a, a, a traffic for a traffic violation for enough time to write the the um, the um, the the um, <laughs> took it out for that for that um, 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 issue, so they can find something else to make them think there's something else going on that they can later do uh, document. Then that's what they will um, 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 use to say why they they held you there for a half an hour. Gotcha. And so to you. it allows. You know, them... I found this. I saw this. I saw this. Right. It allows them to put some time on the clock when normally exactly. after, after they've written yeah, the exactly. ticket, they should be done. Exactly. Okay. Well, Nate Bradley, I appreciate you so much coming on the show here. The Medical Mar Marijuana Survival Guide is available online through the420survivalguide.com. I put up your Twitter as well. Uh, you're Prop215Cop. 
on Twitter. So we'll be following you as well. And uh, thanks for all your work with Leap and now, you know, Lawmen Protecting Patients at lawmenpro.org. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you so much, you guys. You're welcome. All right, folks, stick around. When we come back, we got time for a radical rant. The DEA wants to take a $1.5 million building over a $37 pot sale. We'll get to the bottom of this and outline the hypocrisy when we return. You cut people, you smoke trees till you get what you need now. Designer drugs and mentions most to get through the day. You always get them so high. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Rust Belt of the show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! All right, folks. For uh, this one, we're going to take a look at a story that uh, I think I saw this one on Orange County Weekly, OCWeekly.com. And it just kind of highlights, you know, one of the aspects of the war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco-free drugs. And that is... It's a money grab, folks. It's all about the money. It's simply business. We've played that song a million times, and it's just as true every day. And I, this story from Mostly Weekly just got me thinking about this. I, let me bring this to you. Uh, this has to do with this crackdown. You remember back in last August, the DEA sent out the threatening letters to all the landlords uh, in Southern California and Northern California that were renting their their premises to marijuana dispensaries, you know, to collectives or co-ops, right? And threatening them with, you know, seizure, asset forfeiture of their properties. This is a tactic that's really taken off during the Obama administration. Back in the Bush administration, they would just send DEA in, smash the place up, take all the stuff, put people in the little plastic zip ties, never file any charges, you know, just try to ransack the place. The Obama administration has been a little sneakier about this. They, they have it done through courts and lawyers and in the back and and they know that they can't threaten the dispensary uh, operators because most of the dispensary operators are doing this out of a compassion and or b activism so there's a whole lot of martyr complex there's a whole lot you know oh what you're gonna throw me in prison for helping cancer patients go right ahead right so that leads to really bad PR, you know, Americans for Safe Access will have, you know, a hundred people out there protesting before the even before the news cameras even get there, right? So it's always bad PR to have stormtroopers in body armor with assault weapons and masks, you know, pushing people in wheelchairs and walkers and stuff. That always looks bad. So the Obama administration's taken to threatening the landlords, right? This is a much sneakier tactic because the landlords in most cases aren't doing it out of compassion or activism they're doing it out of money they want to make money they get these properties and they rent them out to people to make money and so you threaten them with not only no longer getting any rent but also taking their property and a lot of them are much more reticent to want to uh, rent out to medical marijuana dispensaries so this goes back to that 
crackdown. In August, when the DEA sent out this uh, these threatening letters, one of the letters went out to the landlords of a building on Ball Road uh, out in Anaheim, a $1.5 million building. Now, as it happens, the owners of this building are what defense attorneys would call the perfect defendants. <laughs> they are law-abiding citizens with no records, and specifically a married couple in late middle age from Irvine. <laughs> the wife is a dentist. The husband is a computer engineer. Right. IT guy and a dentist. Now, this guy holds a government security clearance, so he's remaining anonymous through this whole thing. But basically, couple in their what, late 40s, early 50s, looking to have some money in retirement, make some investment properties, have a building renting out to people. And the DEA sends them a letter. We're going to take your building because of who you're renting to. Now, how they got involved in this, these folks that are involved in this aren't pot people. They're not patients in any way. They're just like they had a dentist and an IT guy who invested in a building. But in 2009, the Deputy Attorney General David Ogden put out a memo, you may recall, uh, for the newly inaugurated Barack Obama, the so-called Ogden memo, that it instructed federal prosecutors not to target the operations in the medical marijuana states that were in clear and unambiguous compliance with state law. That was what everybody understood the directive to be. Now, as soon as the Ogden memo came out, there was an explosion of medical marijuana dispensaries because here you had a newly inaugurated president who during the campaign had said, well, we've got, you know, bigger fish to fry. Well, bigger fish to fry is his latest comment, but he said, you know, we have uh, more uh, prosecutorial resources need to be put toward terrorism and violent crimes. You know, that, that this wasn't something he's going to spend a lot of time on. That president gets inaugurated. The Ogden memo comes out and says, yes, if you're following state law, you're not a priority of ours. We're not going to go after you. So, yeah, lots of people started opening dispensaries and Anaheim was no exception. So this couple from Irvine start getting all these offers, you know, rental office offers from people that want to start collectives. Now, because of the Ogden memo. And because medical marijuana is legal under state law, and because the city of Anaheim gave them business permits, these collectives, this guy and his wife figure they're not doing anything illegal. According to the quote here, I am a law-abiding citizen, he says. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. But, of course, the DEA alleges otherwise. Except, you got here's an interesting twist of this. The DEA which, of course, the DEA has to go after these people because it's the federal law they're breaking. Under California state law, it's medical marijuana. It's a whole different situation. They have to go through feds, right? But the feds, trying to get the seizure of this $1.5 million building, didn't actually have to expend any effort in investigating and prosecuting this. Nearly all the evidence that the DEA is using in this attempt to get steal this building from these people is evidence that was generated by the Anaheim Police Department. So you got a city police department in a city that is giving dispensaries uh, operating licenses. You have the city police department going undercover in stings to, and in these undercover operations, these police officers get fake IDs that are, is, you know, made by the police department. They, they're real. They're real IDs of fake people. Right. Because they can get that stuff. The DMV is right next door and they can take these fake IDs and then they go to doctors and they complain about fake illnesses. And the doctors give them a real recommendation, because as far as the doctor's concerned, here comes someone who presents a valid ID, as far as he can tell, who admits to valid symptoms for which uh, medical marijuana can be recommended in California. Everybody's following the law there. Cop gives them the recommend or the doctor gives the cop a recommendation. Cop goes to this to the dispensary and he buys $37 worth four grams worth of weed for 4.2 grams worth of weed for 37 bucks. So in every step along the way, the, the, the doctor sees a legal ID gives a legal recommendation for a legal medical complaint, taking it to a city uh, ordained business with a license legal under California state law, 
And that's what the Anaheim Police Department is spending their time on, to make sure that, you know, we can we can bust these guys. Now, the, the way that the Anaheim Police Department started doing this, by the way, is they would just look up the dispensaries on weed maps. They would just pull up weed maps and find reviews. Oh, dude, I got this killer OG Kush, and it was like only 30 bucks. It's awesome. And they would find these, and they would go bust them, right? So the, in 2010, they went up against a club that had rented from these people called Remedy Tree. So the landlord, the Irvine couple, they evict the club uh, after the cops investigate this. On June 11, 2011, uh, he rented to a club called Relief Health and Wellness. Once again, Anaheim police investigated the criminal activity just by reading weed maps. On December of 2011, an undercover officer posing as a patient with legitimate doctor's recommendation for cannabis, something required just to get in to the building, purchased 4.2 grams of marijuana for $37. So. Uh, the lawyer in this case, his name is Matthew Pappas, and uh, he represents uh, some other former patients of Relief as well, uh, including one who is a wheelchair-bound amputee who now can't get her marijuana because the place is closed down. Uh, in a lawsuit against Anaheim for violating California's Disabled Persons Act by calling in the feds to crack down on cannabis clubs. The only evidence in this case is, 30, is a $37 purchase of medical marijuana and an anonymous comment on a website that anybody could have written. For this, they want to take a $1.5 million building. And that's why marijuana has got to be legalized. That's why medical doesn't go far enough. So long as it is a crime at any level, someone's going to take advantage of that. We could, you could legalize marijuana in California tomorrow, make it completely 100% legal, no medical. You're 21. It's completely legal. You can grow it. You can sell it. You can have it. You, you could have the marijuana mar marketplace of earth in California, but so long as it's federally illegal, some cops in some jurisdiction that don't like it are going to do investigations and turn that evidence over to the DEA to allow them to do this kind of stuff, to take away the retirement uh, investment of a dentist and a computer scientist who are following state laws, who are following city ordinances, who are doing nothing wrong except in the eyes of the Anaheim PD and the DEA. Now, what upgrades this to major league level hypocrisy to Jimmy Swagger level hypocrisy is the fact that on July 13th and 14th stoners across Southern California will flock to the Anaheim convention center for the Kush Expo, a $20 per ticket pot stravaganza of all things cannabis. Vendors will display their wares, everything from bongs and hookahs to hydroponic growing equipment and nutrients, and doctors will be on hand to write medical marijuana recommendations for folks in the mood to smoke weed in the tented medication area. There will even be a hot girl contest for patients with presumably sore eyes. So let me get this straight, Anaheim. You have a problem with the dentist and the computer scientists who are renting space in their building to a medical marijuana collective that is requiring signed recommendations to merely get in the door so that they can provide medicine as voted on by the majority of Californians to sick and disabled people completely legal under law. You have the problem with that. That's an issue we got to bring the DEA in. But the whole Anaheim Convention Center can be rented out for the Cush Expo to have, you know, medical marijuana girls in their medi pants dancing around on poles and to have medication areas and doctors on site with stethoscopes that they take your they take your vitals uh, over the loud blaring rap music. That's not an issue. The, the dispensary over there that's actually getting medicine to really sick people, that's a problem. But the Kush Expo that's bringing a lot of tourists, bringing a lot of money to Anaheim, that one's just fine. You see why there's such a problem trying to get medical marijuana in some of the other states in the Midwest and the East Coast and especially the South? It's cases like this. Again, I'm not against the Kush Expo. I'm a big fan of this kind of stuff, but parties are parties, folks. Ah, this takes me in a lot of places. We're going to have to continue this in hour two. Toker Talk Radio. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more news and views you can use for the cannabis community. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Until next time, take care of each other, Tokers.
This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You're 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 you're